I welcome you from my side to our next talk today, and it will be uh, given by Sven Saar, um, um, with a wonderful red um, sweater on, <laughs> so easily to, to detect on the um, uh, screen. And Sven Saar is originally from, from Germany and uh, did his World of Teacher training in, in Witten Annen and has been a World of Class teacher for a long time, especially in England and right now also living in England. And he is responsible for the uh, working and responsible for the World of Teacher training in London. And furthermore, he is doing a lot of teacher training courses all over the world, as I have heard or understood, you did a teacher training in India online already. So now India, it's um, four and a half hours from now, so it will be much later now. Um, yeah, and he's also an author of, of many books. And the last one in, in the German uh, title is Beziehungskunst. I really hope there will be an English translation coming out soon. What will be the title of that in, in English? Actually, uh, that's not quite true. I'm an author of one book, precisely. I'm not really a writer. Um, and we don't know yet if this book will ever come out in, Engl in English, um, but it might come out in Portuguese. Okay. Please, can you uh, give a good translation for that anyway, so that people know what I'm talking about? The Art of Relationship. Okay. So this um, will um, this is has been published this year and um, it's frequently used in Waldorf schools. Um, and the topic he's talking today about is is, is related to that book, uh, too. I think um, he's going to speak about Waldorf and diversity, personal and professional challenges. Thank you for being with us, um, especially today, Sven. That's really nice that you can do it. And please start with your talk. Thank you very much. Um, I feel very honored to to be here. Um, I've loved all the talks so far. And uh, I will be speaking mostly about racism um, rather than diversity today. And if you take one look at me, you should be raising your eyebrows right now. Um, and I'll explain. There's a, there's a story to this. Um, I will be speaking from a personal perspective, and that is not unconnected to the book I just published. One of the contributors of this book, which includes um, several articles about gender identity and how to deal with that in a pedagogical context, um, looked at me quizzically at some point during the process of putting the book together and said, you realize that you belong to the group of people who have furthest to go. And I knew exactly what she was talking about, of course. Um, as an old white man from Central Europe, there are quite a few things that I need to know about myself before I can begin to approach a subject like diversity with any kind of authority. In the first meeting that we had of contributors, Martin will remember this, um, 12 of us sitting around a Zoom table, I tried to do the chairman kind of thing of saying in a jolly sort of tone to everybody, okay, let's see what we really want to achieve with this and let's all speak without prejudice. At which point one of the contributors raised her hand and said, I don't think we can do that. What we can attempt to do is to become aware of our prejudices and include them whenever we speak in as conscious a way as possible. But speaking without prejudice that's a too tall an order for me. So those two little episodes tell you a little bit about why this is a personal story that I'm telling this evening. And I came to the subject of equality and diversity because I was a tutor on the London Waldorf Seminar. And it was just time. It was time that we addressed the issue. And it felt to me to do that. Um, partly because I had volunteered to take part in a seminar provided by the Steiner Schools Fellowship in the UK, which was provided by an organization called Equality Teach. Nothing to do with World of Education, a mainstream organization that tries to educate people in sensitivity on, on issues of equality and diversity. And I came back from that really impressed. So somewhat naively, I started teaching about this subject and I tried to give it a world of perspective to some extent. 
And then something really interesting happened. I received a phone call from South Africa. These were two teachers from there who represented the Federation Council of, of the World of Association in South Africa. And they said, Sven, we've heard you can do this. Can you do a Zoom talk for us? And to, I'll be honest with you, I, saw, I thought that was a joke to begin with. Um, you can't possibly expect me, <laughs> look at me, to do this in South Africa. How That is wrong on so many levels. And then one of them said something very powerful that really changed my mind on the whole issue. Two kindergarten teachers, one white, one black. The black kindergarten teacher said to me, you do realize, Sven, that we've been trying to tell you guys for over a hundred years that it's not our problem. I think it's time you own this. And it was one of those moments where I was speechless for a few moments because she was so right. But I hadn't never, I hadn't, I hadn't ever really seen it like that before. Um, as usual, I will be sharing my screen with you for most of this talk. And occasionally you will be needing either access to your chat button or a little pen and paper to jot something down because there will be an interactive element to this. As you can see, I've given this little talk a subtitle and called it an insufficient introduction. It's the personal thing. A lot of the things that I'm going to cover are things that you might find interesting or even sensational. And they might influence what you think of me. They might influence what you think of Rudolf Steiner. But as much as it is personal for me, it's personal to you and for anybody who begins to deal with this in a serious way. And so I should be taking this seriously and give you a bit of a warning. And this is it. If you have been disadvantaged, discriminated against, violated or patronized in the name of racial superiority, gender issues, sex, whatever it is, there may be moments that trigger you. And I don't think I can avoid that. But you may also find some things painful if you're an admirer of Rudolf Steiner. I don't know. Um, we will see this. Um, but I'm looking forward to making some offers that come from the path that I've gone so far. And I'm nowhere near the end of that path. Let's begin. What I'm trying to do as an educator is to try and minimize the danger of causing hurt and offense. That's my bottom line, isn't it? Yes, I'm trying to do good, but where I can't do good, at least I'm trying not to do harm. And when it comes to this field, I feel I need to go through it systematically to make sure that I minimize those chances. The first thing is to look at myself. Who am I? Why am I uh, the way I am? And how does it influence the kind of things I do and the thoughts I have? Secondly, the curriculum I represent, I deliver. The statutory aspects of the society I live in need examination too. Then I need to look at anthroposophy because that's something I take quite seriously as a world of teacher. And then I come back to myself. Now that I've learned things, now that I've done my research into curriculum, into anthroposophy, into racism, has anything changed in me? I'd like to take you along on some of those steps that I've gone through. Because as an anthroposophist, I'm a human being who struggles with cognitive development issues for decades. Out of choice. I welcome moments that discombobulate me because they offer me something new. So this young contributor who <laughs> looked at me almost with pity in her eyes when she said, you've got a long way to go. I said, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to, to going that way. I, I thank you for the opportunity to take those steps. And certainly editing the book um, was an incredible learning journey for me. If you were here last year when I gave a little talk about putting the child at center, you may remember these two parables. 
They are a visual representation of a picture Steiner draws with words in the first lecture of the Foundations course in 1919. They represent everything that is generic, everything that we incarnate into, what we find already there, so that's the brown bit, and those things we bring along with us that have no earthly relevance as yet, that's the blue bit. Body and spirit, you might call them, and where they come together, increasingly so, and increasingly harmoniously so, with the help of my teachers and my parents, they create that central space in this Venn diagram, and that's what Steiner calls the soul, the soul experience, part earth, part spirit, but not completely either of those two things. So if I now examine my soul realm, the place where I live and I'm at home, I find that a lot of the things that live there um, are determined by things that I haven't really had anything to do with. So the fact that I was born in Germany makes a difference to me. Surely I can't ignore that. But how much does it? How much does it influence my Waldorfness or my musicality or my level of education, the food I eat? What about my gender? Do I have particular food preferences to stay with that picture because I'm male? Or does it matter not at all? Who knows? What about my parents' values? Well, they have a lot to do with my nutritional choices. Their wealth and education to some extent, and my culture and upbringing too. So you see, once I go through this tick list, I begin to get a better view of myself. It doesn't mean that I orientate myself in that place forever, and I don't want you to think that I put any kind of value on this process. It's just a fact. I have a conversation with myself to ask myself, who am I? And there will be parts, fortunately, blissfully, there will be parts that actually aren't due to any of these things. I make choices in my life where I can, I think, with a reasonable amount of clarity, say that's nothing to do with any of those five things on that list. Not many, but a few. And it's good to know that too. I'd like to show you a picture now, a photograph. And if you're ready to put something in the chat box, I'd like you to write in the chat box, what phrase did I put into Google search in order to get this picture as a result? This is the first picture that came up when I put a certain phrase into Google, okay? And this is the picture. So the question again, what phrase did I put into Google image search that resulted in this picture? I wonder, Martin, whether you've done the same exercise because you got the right answer. The phrase is African house. First picture that comes up for me. It may well be different for you, depending on who you are and where you are but I'll come to that in a minute. You can probably guess what phrase I put into Google to get the next picture. You can probably see where this is going. Well, this time it's Julian who got it. European house was the phrase. So what happened here? Let's assume for a moment that I didn't do this as an exercise, but I was genuinely interested in what do houses in Africa look like. Either I didn't have an idea at all, and I see this, and now I do. Now I walk around for a considerable time in my future with an image that an African house looks like that building that we just saw. Or I had a picture already in my mind, and I've just seen it confirmed. Either way, I've received something that is now mine. It was Google's before and it is now mine. What's happened here? In the worst case scenario, I already ha had these pictures in my mind and I've just received what is called confirmation bias. That's how algorithms work. Google knows me, of course. Google knows that I'm in Europe, knows my age, 
I mean, not Mr. Google, but the algorithm that serves it. My age, my gender, the kind of things I've spent money on, how much money I spend on those things, all those things feed the algorithm that feeds me that picture. And that does something that messes with me. It is a, a form of education, you could argue, but it's a problematic form of education. Pictures are very powerful things. I've got one more of these for you that I'd like to ask you. What was it that I put into Google for the following picture? Many of you are, are clicking into that zone now, aren't you? Because the phrase was beautiful face. Not Caucasian beautiful face, not female beautiful face, just beautiful face. There is no man on this picture. There is no black person on this picture. Yeah, this is um, a very narrow pick and slice that, again, the algorithm assumes will feed what I'm looking for. And it, because it thinks that, it does. If I now interact with one of those pictures, I will leave a footprint that will lead to that algorithm becoming ever more refined. Um, and so the more I interact, for example, with a white pretty woman from this thing, the more white pretty women will I see on as a search for that, and the narrower my horizon will become. And this is a new situation, of course. It's a bit like going to a library and looking, trying to look something up and finding that there's only one book. So you read that book and you leave a mark, a smudge mark on one of the pages. And the next time you go to the library, there isn't a book anymore. There's just that one page. So you find ever more what you're looking for in this kind of system. And of course, that, that, does, that has a tremendous effect on, on where we are going with this. So um, I'd like to share something with you, which I would consider good practice in this respect because this phrase is something that is probably relatively familiar to those of us who are world of class teachers in central europe and i must confess that i've used it before not for about 10 years but i have i was asked by a pupil what color should i use for the face and i said skin color and of course i meant pink I'm ashamed of that now. I could have known better. I should have known better, but it happened to me. And to some extent, it still happens. We're in that space. We're gradually moving out of that space, but we're in that space. And I'd like to show you an element of good practice from Japan um, that I was very, very impressed with. This is a Japanese cosmetics company called Shiseido. And I think the little advertising film speaks for itself. Can you hear the sound? Yes.
Isn't that a wonderful initiative? Um, and I know that Stockmar is now catching up, but I think in the UK, at least, Crayola stole our thunder there. They got, they got in first. If you now go into an, a UK art supply store and buy a box of Crayola skin color crayons, you get skin colors. Yeah, you get all that range. And so it should be. So it should be. This is a, you, you realize that, uh, in the little film, they said this was a combined art and ethics class. A lovely, lovely thing to do. So let's examine for a moment what it means to be white. And maybe not as old as me, but certainly if you're in my generation, you, you do well to have a look at the next few questions. And this is where your pen and paper comes in. You don't have to do very much. But what I would like you to do is to answer for yourself 12 questions that I'm going to put to you, one after the other. And all you have to do is give yourself a point if your answer to the question is yes. Okay? You don't have to share this with anybody. You don't have to write the answer down. Just give yourself a point for every yes. Here we go. If I wish... I can arrange to be in the company of people of my ethnic group most of the time. Two. When I turn on the TV or the newspaper, I see people of my ethnic group widely represented. Three. When I am told about the civilization of our society, I am shown that people of my ethnic group created it. I can be sure that my children will be given materials that acknowledge their ethnic group. <coughs> if I want to borrow money, I can be sure that my color or ethnic group will not be a factor in the bank's decision. I don't have to educate my children about systemic racism for their daily physical protection. If I do well in a difficult situation, I am never called a credit to my people. I'm never asked to speak on behalf of the people of my ethnic group. If I ask to speak to the person in charge, I can expect that person to belong to the same ethnic group as me. I can buy plasters and bandages in my skin color. If my leadership is unsuccessful, I can be sure it is not because of my skin color. When I talk with my mouth full, people do not assume it is because of my culture. Could you now write the number of your yeses into the chat, please? Only the number. So we have an international forum here. Depending on time zones, people from all around the world, although it's very hard for people from East Asia to be here right now. It's too late for most of them. So well done if you're here from India or further east than that. Um, but you can see which numbers tend to proliferate here. For myself, I answer yes to all 12 of them. When I gave this course about a year ago in India, the average score of about the, the, the 80 or 90 people who were there was between four and five, the average score. And these were middle class people, world of parents, world of teachers, world of um, lecturers. And you realize as a white person, when you look at this, okay, if that's what it is, then there's something I must be missing. Surely, if I've not suffered any of these things, these situations, if I've never been in these situations, then there is a certain level of life experience that is incomplete in me. That's privilege. As a privileged person, I am incomplete in my life experience. And that has a definite approach, uh, a definite consequence for my ability to be empathetic with people who do suffer discrimination and so on. And I've talked about racism a lot, 
but I just want to make the point very clearly that um, an intersectional approach is far more rewarding than trying to keep things like feminism and and racism separate here. Um, I might pat myself on the shoulder very fondly, as I did, for giving an equality and diversity seminar in London to my students. <laughs> and then I hear a comedy program on the radio. And I, I started to laugh because it's a comedy program. And then the laughter froze in my gullet. And when you hear it, you will probably know why that is. I've, I'm going to play it for you now. Souvenir program. So to sum up, it all comes down to the density of the timber. If we can keep it to say 500 kilograms a meter square, then the project's feasible. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, well, I'd, I wouldn't like to say. I see. Thank you, Jim. But obviously, denser timber is going to have a knock-on to the subsidence profile. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, does anyone have details of that? Uh, uh, I do, yeah. Oh, Alice, great. Uh, fill us in. Uh. Right. Well, the site is located in a large alluvial plain. I see, yeah. So it's impossible. Ah, well, not necessarily, because actually, groundwater extraction has been decreasing steadily oh, right. over so the last Right, so we're in with 10... a chance. For instance, if we can well, well, we might a couple be, of But the thing is, the, 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 the thing you... is um, I've actually managed to see a copy of the county surveyor's report. Oh, <laughs> right. And I bet I can guess what that said. Yeah. Well, you, you don't need to, because I can carry on telling you. The usual doom and gloom and ass covering, probably, what, 26, 28 percent? Interestingly, there are a lot more optimistic Oh, at least. I bet more like 35. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, I can just right. tell you. But even you, so, like, taking that as a working hypothesis, somewhere in the 25 to 35 regions... I mean, can literally tell you what the number is. Is there any way of telling whether that's likely to rise or fall? Uh, yes, uh, yes, there is a way. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, Alice, were you... Uh, yes, I was, yeah. Sorry, uh, you have the floor. OK, so the number they're actually giving yeah. is only 18. Well, that oh. does surprise me, because... Well, and I did, in fact, ask about their future projection, and the response was surprisingly and the rest is optimistic. History. Well, no, <laughs> the rest is news, which I have, and I'm, I'm in the process of giving to so you. So I think what Alice is saying here is mm. that we... I'm no, guys, I'm actually here. You confident. don't have to guess. It's not like a seance. Yeah. <laughs> I think what, that is what, what you say. Guys, hello? Yes. She's certainly saying something, isn't she? <laughs> I mean, can anyone hear Sounds me? Sounds like she's got yeah. some pretty important information. Well, I, yeah. I haven't. Yeah. I just, Only there was some way of finding out what she knows. I mean, you could just shut up and some let me tell you. Some sensible, realistic way that still involves me talking. <laughs> Men, just let us finish. <laughs> You're doing really, really well these days about letting us start talking sometimes. We're very proud of you. Now, just go that extra mile and let us finish talking. It's not... That's right. Don't just cut in because you think you know where she's going with... So, I had a really profound experience again with this because um, I was laughing, as was the audience in this. And then I asked myself, if the person being discriminated against and patronized in this little clip wasn't a woman, but a black person, would I still be laughing? And thank goodness for the Black Lives Matter movement that has stopped cutting us slack and being nice to us for patronizing and disenfranchising them. And I think it's high time women did that too, as they were trying to do in this particular, in this particular um, news clip. I had another little biographical experience when I was sharing a seminar with Ulrike Sievers in Germany. And this was about Beziehungskunst, about sex education. And I made a lighthearted, almost semi-conscious remark to the love a mother feels for her child. Yeah, the kind of love a mother feels for her child. And she said, stop. You've made an assumption just now. You're making an assumption that every mother has to feel that kind of love for her child simply because she's a mother. Now, at that moment, I could have tried to become defensive and said, oh, well, I didn't mean it like that. But the fact is, I did mean it like that. She was right. And because I wasn't feeling particularly defensive at that moment, this became a good conversation. What could have otherwise been a, a, a conversation, a completely inappropriate conversation about cancel culture. What was she giving me? An opportunity to learn, to 
discover something about myself that I hadn't known or that I hadn't known sufficiently because of my privilege. So let's go back to the slideshow. Because privilege is a dangerous thing. Most of the time, we don't really know that we've got it. Privilege is when we think something isn't a problem because it's not a problem to us personally. And so I need to become aware of my unintentional power to offend or cause hurt. And that's quite difficult. How do you stop being racist if you're not a racist? And the answer is in this sentence. Intention must be secondary to effect. So you don't ask yourself, what did I mean to say? But you ask yourself, what effect did my words have? And that changes the picture. But it's not so much so that you can please everybody around you or pat yourself on the shoulder. It's just the part of your path, of your self-education path. And there is this response and uh, the question about cancel culture is a question one should, one should maybe address of a, a somebody like Salman Rushdie, who has suffered tremendously for his causing offense to people. And he said this a year and a half ago. He said the idea that being offended is a valid critique has gained a lot of traction. So what he was referring to a, a year and a half ago is that we can do with we, we think we can devalidate somebody's work because it's offensive. And J.K. Rowling and Salman Rushdie are probably the best known and most prominent recipients of that kind of hate, um, especially online kind of hate. But this is not a topic I want to open tonight because I said I was going to talk from a personal perspective, and that's more of a general thing. So this is about my journey because if I choose this red line that I'm going to work on the effect I have, then that might make, may cause me to make changes in my outlook and in my behavior. I'd like to share something else I consider good practice here. And that is the diversity statement of the Waldorf School in San Francisco. I should say that the next few slides have a fair bit of writing on them. Please don't try and read it all while I speak. Um, you will be getting this as a PDF afterwards. Um, this will be available on the website, so you'll have time to look at the quotes in context. I've highlighted the bits that I'm particularly interested in. So the San Francisco Waldorf School says here that it doesn't embrace any aspect of anthroposophy dogmatically, and they are aware that there are patriarchal Eurocentric forces that interfere. But what do they interfere with and how? And now comes the, the crunch paragraph. We try to awaken our awareness of unconscious biases around deep breath, race, socioeconomic status, sex and gender identity, sexual orientation, neurodiversity, age, physical ability, religion, nationality, and any other characteristic that might blind us to the dignity inherent in every individual. In other words, if I can't see your dignity, it's not your problem, it's mine, because I'm looking at the wrong thing. So this is very much something that is not just a political correctness statement. This means something. I'm very grateful to the San Francisco School. Normally, I am a bit skeptical about these kind of website statements. But I think these people have really looked at it. They've really looked at the language they use and how they use it. So if I now take this seriously and I consider my practice in the light of this, then this will have consequences for my relationship to the curriculum, for example. All these little boxes come from a picture that many of you will have seen, the so-called curriculum tree. I think it was painted on a wall in Michael Hall's school some years ago. And on it, you can read exactly what each school, what each school year will do. And this is taken from their story or history curriculum. And if I take this seriously, I need to ask myself for my children in my country in this year, 
what opportunities are here for socialization, arriving in the context into which they chose to be born, for qualification, learning skills and competencies that are relevant to their lives, and for individuation, discovering who they are and whether and how they matter. Gerd Biester, in his 2014 book, The Beautiful Risk of Education, mentions these three aspects, I quoted them last year already, as a bit of a shorthand for what we're trying to achieve in every lesson we teach. We arrive, we progress, and we discover ourselves. And if you want to read more about this, um, then Martin's paper on decolonizing, decolonizing your curriculum is a, is a really good place to start. There have been attempts, good attempts too. This one, Serene Fong's master's thesis from the Stuttgart master's course, the international master's course about an Asian world of curriculum. Um, Pon Panasot's attempts, pioneering attempts to adapt the story curriculum to the Thai culture. But let's have a look a little bit on some things that are still prevalent practice out there in the real world. We've celebrated Michaelmas not long ago. In 2018, a Catholic church in Ghana commissioned a sculptor to put a statue of Saint Michael into their garden, into the garden behind their church. Now, I don't know what kind of sculptor would choose to put a sculpture like this into the garden of an African church or any church for that matter. But you can see immediately what's wrong with this, can't you? A triumphant white person standing on a black devil. Now, granted, this was before the George Floyd incident. And I don't quite know if that sculpture, which caused a lot of controversy and international attention, is still standing. But that's what it did. Well, something that I know is still in practice now as we speak is this. For people in the British establishment who gain particular attention for their service in a foreign country or in relation to foreign and commonwealth affairs, they receive from the king nowadays, they would have received from the queen, the order of St. Michael and St. George. The letters around it translate as pledge for a better age. And look at the picture it shows. I don't think I have to talk much about that, but this is right now, okay? So this is, of course, a talk in the world of world where I live. So I survey the literature that's available there. I ask myself, how is it with us and racism? I know that there is a lot of effort being put in right now to avoid structural, institutional, and also casual racism. The latest volume of the German magazine Erziehungskunst is completely devoted to that. Very good articles in there. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to Rudolf Steiner. The 1890s. Steiner was incredibly ahead of his time, I think. This is what he wrote about the so-called question of genus and individuality. Remember the two parables I showed you earlier on? Yeah, that chapter in, in the philosophy of freedom. And he says here that a man sees in a woman, a woman in a man always, almost always too much of the general characteristics of the opposite sex and too little of what is individual. This is Steiner, how we love him, isn't it? He, he really was an early feminist. We know that. We know that not just from his writings, we also know that from his actions. He really made no patriarchal gesture that I'm aware of in any of the decisions that he made. Um, so this is really quite powerful. And of course, the sentence for which he's almost best known, and certainly in relation to the philosophy of freedom, is this one. A bit clunky in the English translation. Anyone who judges human beings according to the generic character stops short at the very point beyond which they begin to be individuals whose activity rests on free self-determination. So don't judge a book by its cover. 
judge it by its content. That was very radical in the 1890s. And to some extent, it's still radical now. I'd like to spend the next 20 minutes or so looking at racism in Steiner's work. And I'd like to repeat the trigger warning I made earlier on. I'm going to quote Rudolf Steiner, first auditory, and then I'm going to show you a passage or two or three, which I consider problematic. This has been done before. And what I would like to offer you is, from a personal perspective, something I found helpful, which is what I would call a differentiated approach. Because I think not all aspects of racism in Rudolf Steiner's work can be looked at with the same perspective. So again, I, this is a serious trigger warning, especially if you've been discriminated against, because what I'm about to say might offend you and hurt you. I'm going to quote Rudolf Steiner, and I would like you to pay attention, especially if you're old and white like me, what that sentence does to you. This is the sentence. You can see, for example, that Negroes are also regarded as human beings, yet in them, the human form appears quite differently. I won't repeat it, but I would like to show you the context in which Steiner said this. It's August 1922, and Steiner gives a lecture in Oxford. The lecture has nothing to do with races or with people of color. In the lecture, he explains to his audience that we will not try and homogenize the practice of world of education. Simply because there are two classes, one doesn't mean that what happens in those classes is the same. Because he says, human beings aren't the same. We love variety, he says. And in a world of school, you will always find that class 1A is doing something very different from class 1B. And he goes on to say, you're all human beings, but you all look different. No one's hair is like that of another. Life displays variety in manifold forms. And he works his way down the list, and then he arrives at this statement about the Negroes. And look who he's talking to. That's his audience. All of them white. And look at where he's speaking. Oxford University, the prime breeding ground for Europe's racist imperialism. All white influential people around him. And yes, he's using the word Negro, which we wouldn't use nowadays, but I think he's actually making an anti-racist point. He's saying to these people something which these people need to hear. That Waldorf is pro-variety. But if you lift out that particular sentence and don't offer its context, it becomes profoundly offensive. And this is, of course, what World of Critics love to do. So this is a good example for a statement which requires and deserves to be contextualized. The next statement is different. And I beg your forgiveness for not reading that out aloud. So I will spare you my voice for about one minute while you can read the statement for yourself. I would like to share with you my personal take on this, because I said it would be a personal talk. I don't find anything that deserves contextualization here. I find this profoundly shocking, and I only have negative associations with it, especially because he said it 30 years after what he said in the philosophy of freedom. It profoundly disappointed me. I fell out of love with Rudolf Steiner over saying this. It was in 1922. He was speaking to workers at the Goetheanum. And my interpretation of it is that he was making a joke. But it's a, a deeply racist and offensive joke. And I just can't forgive him for that. Um, so that's all I want to say about this. And um, the only thing that it's useful for is for the next question I'm going to ask you. If you buy this book, GA348, 
Now, in an, in an English bookshop at Rudolf Steiner House in London, you won't find this passage. Because in the most recent edition, it was taken out. Now, this is the question, and maybe we can come to that afterwards in the Q&A session. Was that good or wasn't it? Was that wise to take this out? Or was it disingenuous? Should it have been kept in with a critical side note? I'd love to hear what you think about that. But we'll go to the next type of statement now. This one is not Rudolf Steiner. This one is again San Francisco Waldorf School. And I like the language they use here. They say, we recognize certain statements as incorrect and offensive. We explicitly reject any theory or statement in Rudolf Steiner's work that characterizes or judges individual human beings as superior or inferior based on racial, gender, ethnic, or other group identity. Completely clear. It wasn't always thus. The process began in the year 2000, the Dutch Commission report. That's very different language. You see here, there are statements that if they were in pub made in public by a person, now could be a violation of the criminal code of the Netherlands. That's a very careful, some would say cowardly formulation of the fact, but it was a start. In 2008, the Frankfurt Memorandum, you can Google these things, went further. And most recently, the Stuttgart de Declaration of the Bund der Freien Waldorfschulen and the Declaration of the Goetheanum went a step further yet, but I must be honest with you, for me, they didn't go far enough. None of them were quite strong enough to condemn what I've just shared with you, the mulatto's quote. Now we come to the third category of quotes. Look what he's saying here in 1904 in Cosmic Memory. He's talking about Aryans as survivors of Atlantis. And in the last sentence of this quote, he says something that certainly in the light of, of subsequent developments could be seriously negatively interpreted. At the present time, it is the task of the Aryans to develop the faculty of thought and all that belongs to it. So why does it belong into a different category? I'll show you. In 1909, he changed his mind. He then said, the idea of race is only really applicable to old Atlantis. We don't speak of an Indian race, a Persian race, etc., because that is no longer correct. And I would say on this case, Rudolf, I'm with you. The human being is allowed to change their minds. I did, frequently. And I don't want to have to apologize. Changing your mind is a good thing. And he contextualizes it as well. He says, we're now no longer the theosophical movement, we're the anthroposophical movement. And when we weren't yet, we talked a different language. The anthroposophical movement seeks to unite, unite people of all nations. We bridge differences, we bridge distinctions. We don't, we're not interested in the gaps. But at some point, our movement had childish illnesses. But one must get beyond the illnesses of childhood and be clear that the idea of race ceases to have any meaning, especially in our age. So he makes it very clear five years later. And I can say to him, okay, I'm good with that. Thank you for doing that. I completely disagreed with what you said in Cosmic Memory, but I can see that you see that as well now. Thank you, Rudolf Stein. So I said this is a systematic contextualization. So I'll just summarize that briefly. There are expressions that appear racist to the superficial view, but aren't in reality when you look closely. There are expressions which I think can't be excused. And I need to now work out what they mean for me as an anthroposophist. And there are expressions which Steiner made, but from which he later distanced himself. And beyond the 16 passages, there are also passages we haven't talked about yet. I'm about to show you one of those. I've not come across this 
in a lot of discussion yet, but it's a very well-known passage. One of the most used book in teacher education, the education of the child in the light of anthroposophy. Look at the beginning of the second paragraph. Look at the uneducated savage beside the average European. The uneducated savage with his ego follows his passions, impulses, and cravings almost like an animal. Now, I don't know on what level it would have been okay to say that in 1907. Never mind today. But this booklet, this pamphlet is being used in most teacher education centers, almost as the first thing that is given to students. So I asked one of the leaders of one of the seminars where I am a tutor, and I said, do you use this? What, what's your idea on this passage? And she said, yes, we do use it, but we've changed the wording. And I said, okay, can you show me, please, what have you changed? And she showed me this. Look at a member of a tribal community living in the wilds of nature. The member of the tribal community with his ego follows his passions, impulses, and cravings almost like an animal. Problem solved? I don't think so. You see, this is the difference between a genuine wish to address a problem and just exercising political correctness, making a gesture, re removing the word savage, but ending up with something that is just as offensive as the first one was. So if, like me, you're working in teacher education and you're faced with this, you now have a decision to make. My decision is that, for me, the whole booklet is compromised by this passage. You may come to a different view on this, but I don't give this to the students in my institute. We start straight away with Anthropological Foundations, which was 16 years later, and it doesn't contain passages like this. The wiser Steiner, you might say, I don't know. But I don't want this book um, in my courses. And as I say, I can't speak for you, but this is my, this is my point. We need to make our own informed decisions on this. Some years ago, the British version of the education section decided to, move, to meet weekly. This was at the beginning of the pandemic. So the class members among the British Waldorf community who formed the education section, we decided that we would have weekly Zoom meetings. And that has actually continued every Tuesday afternoon about a dozen of us, sometimes more, meet and work together. And for about six months in 2020 and 2021, we looked at racism in anthroposophy. And to begin with, my hope was that at the end of that process, we would together write a statement. And we could then put out that statement to the world of schools in Britain, and they could adapt it and put it on their websites. And you know what happened? The longer we did this work, the more we realized there wasn't going to be a statement at the end of it. We even sort of half tried, but we failed. And you know what? Why, why we failed? Because we realized you can't do this work for someone else. Even the wonderful San Francisco statements, just because I've read them, doesn't make me any less prone to, to having an effect, an offensive effect or a discriminatory effect. The only way I can address this is if I look at my own practice and if I do the work, if I walk the walk. And the young students that I've had the privilege of engaging with, especially those who challenge me, they are my guides on that path. What's your instinctive response to that picture? For those of you who don't recognize the original behind it, it's a relatively precise copy of Leonardo's Last Supper. So all the meaningful gestures of the hands are there. The body language is replicated. This is on the wall of um, the tea room in a Baptist chapel in New York. And when I showed this to one of my friends and colleagues, he said, well, that's where I would draw the line. 
you can't do that to Leonardo. And I said, okay, keep talking. Tell me what you mean by that. Tell me why you have a problem with the fact that here is an African-American artist who decides to paint a mural for an African-American church in which the people who visit that church see themselves. And he's even gone to the trouble of studying the wisdom of Leonardo's picture and recognizing the profundity of the hand gestures to that extent that he's copied them every single bit of it, even down to the beautiful upturn, downturn gesture of Christ's hands here. So on what level do you have a problem with that? And this became quite a long and acrimonious conversation. You get a similar flavor of conversation when you consider this picture. On the walls of many kindergartens, of course, in Europe, certainly, also in some other countries. And there are volumes written and spoken about this picture. I'm not going to diss it or disparage it in any way. This is a fantastic picture, you know, wonderful what Raphael has achieved here. But in some kindergartens, in and outside of Europe, they get replaced by images such as these. We have a very earthbound, African mother with her child. Um, we have a boy and his father. No reference to a woman in this gesture. What does this do to us? Can we live with that? So for me, the question is not so much what needs to change. The question is who wants to change? And I do. And I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sven. That was very personal, very clear, and very far going in a certain way, um, exposing yourself with your questions. And I can imagine there are a, a lot of comments and questions coming up now. So. Who is going to speak first? Can I go first? Uh, this is Sivish and Kree. Yes, please. I'm sorry for not switching on the video. It is such a profound experience, I should say. Uh, there are questions that I have been, you know, pondering over since I started reading. There's this there one specific paragraph that I was, you know, grappling with for a long time. I think the question is answered now. The savage words that was there, that particular paragraph. And uh, I think, yes, as individuals, we all need to change. And it's a it's journey. I think we never arrive at the destination. Because if you had asked me certain things 15 years back, I would have had a very different perspective of talking about uh, skin color or uh, talking about uh, sexism because we all are tied to our own conditioning that comes from family, our ethnicity and all that. But I think we all evolve. And now I have a very different perspective of all these things. And when I stand in front of a class, especially as an educator, I ensure that I I'm completely free of any judgment. And I think as an individual, I strive every day to do that. To not get caught in all those unconscious bias. And unconscious bias, as uh, Sam mentioned, I think it is there all around us. I think the algorithm and social media and mainstream media are throwing all of these at us every day. And I think that is that itself is a struggle for some of us, you know, to not get caught in that. And I think it's a it's an eye-opening experience for me. This, this lecture has been really wonderful. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Shiva and Shankari, for sharing, for sharing that. Um, I was a bit astonished, Sven, when you said because of that um, passage in um, education of the child, you don't use it anymore. Um, 
why not face it? Why not speak about it? So if I do, of course, I do teacher training. I use that book. I have many other questions yeah. around that book in real, because and other aspects, I think it's um, often used too, too often in a naive way in relation to world of education, because we have to consider that time, at that time, Steiner hadn't, um, didn't have any experience with, with yeah. Waldorf, and he didn't want to, to, to found a Waldorf school. He was a, um, an esoteric uh, philosopher. Theosophy was his topic, and he just um, didn't outline what would be the consequence of theosophy bringing into um, pedagogy. So it was, out of my view, really top down of doing pedagogy. And it's surprising and it's an adventure to see when he really started to do a school, he did it totally differently and almost, almost never referred to that first book of 1907. Nevertheless, it's interesting as a step in his considerations around pedagogy. And why not face a passage like that? Yes. You know, it's the age of colonization. He should have known better. Yes. Speaking about savages at that time, you know, this is a picture, you know, um, of, of, of European people towards um, Africa and colonization. And he is part of it. And why not address it? And I, I agree with you, Just. Yeah. Um, I, I probably have to contextualize the fact here that I'm working in a part-time institute. Mm. So if I if I was wearing, working in Alanos with full-time students, there is no way that wouldn't come into the curriculum. But because I have to make economic okay. choices about yeah. what I bring in first, I've decided to okay. leave it out. So uh, economy that's, reasons. That's the only reason. Can yes. totally see. Yeah. We definitely uh, thematize it in, under colonialization and imperialism aspects, definitely. Mm -hmm. And we look at it for other reasons too, but mm -hmm. later. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, a hand by uh, Nitu and then Martin after that. Yeah, uh, this is Nitu here. Hi, Zuen. Um, so I actually have a question uh, regarding the curriculum. So I am from India and uh, Waldorf schools have been there uh, running successfully in India for many, many years now. But, you know, still there is this uh, resistance of bringing this, con you know, the contextualizing of content. So is there something you can suggest, Zuen, as a... Uh, as an icebreaker, which we as educators could do from our end. I don't know I'm, uh, if I'm clear. Who has created the ice you want to break? Uh, we all actually, I mean, uh, not we, I mean, we are the new guys. We, we are fairly new in the system, but... Uh, uh, there, there are systems in place, there are guidelines that have been laid down. So if mm -hmm. one wants to uh, bring in something new, many a times it's not accepted and said, why don't you follow what has already been done? Yeah, you know, so. we're moving away from that. And, uh, you know, uh, three weeks ago, Martin's lecture in, uh, summarized that beautifully. There are um, the people I work with in India are all, without exception, I think, trying to move away from that attitude. Keep repeating what you've been told. And everybody's stepping into those admittedly rather tight shoes of the world of curriculum creator. But it's our task to widen those shoes and make them more comfortable to wear, I think. And uh, your being here is part of that journey. I think I can't give a detailed answer to your question because that would be wrong. <laughs> From me. Maybe Martin wants to say something on that. You. You've got your hand up. Well, I put my hand up before that question came. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Um, and I obviously could say quite a lot, uh, but I think I said quite a lot a few weeks ago. And I think there are, we have, we have perspectives, we have tools, if you like, that we can use to um, 
you know, ask questions about what is the right content for our curriculum where we happen to be. But I would just like coming back to this question of the education of the child in the light of anthroposophy, uh, 1907, and a cluster of lectures around that time which had very similar titles. Um, it's quite interesting to note that in 1907, there was a major international outcry um, against the behavior of the German colonial troops in uh, Southwest Africa. This was not something that was just kind of, we've only discovered recently. There was a major outcry. People were incensed, even to the extent that the Kaiser felt obliged, which he didn't normally do, to actually make a statement justifying those actions. So this went through the press. And for somebody who was an avid reader of newspapers and someone who responded to the kind of the issues of the day, I, I think it is astonishing that he wasn't sensitive to that. And I wonder why not. Mm -hmm. And um, I try to sort of um, take an interpretive approach to, to Steiner. I like to see him as somebody whose ideas evolved. There, there is a sort of undercurrent of ideas that he expressed in his early philosophical works, which, which actually underpin Waldorf education. It's not that obvious, but you can find them. And uh, as I think I mentioned in the questions after my talk, I, I would be quite happy to um, only focus on the Steiner, the anthroposophical work that Steiner poured into his specifically Waldorf lectures, which are actually quite different to many of the things that went before it. Now, I know there are people who object to that and say, well, you, you know, you can't sort of pick and choose, you can't cherry pick and ignore the rest. But it is a puzzle. And I think <laughs> that, um, to, to do justice to him, his purpose, as Jos was just saying, his purpose at that time was to try to demonstrate to the world that theosophy, as it was at the time, um, was not just a kind of um, uh, spiritualist or esoteric um, uh, pursuit, but that it was something that could seriously contribute to renewal of society and science and things like that. It was like it was almost trying too hard to show that spiritual science has got a practical answer for all kinds of things. And the analogy that he makes in this famous passage is that he's basically saying that the I has the function of the civilizing core in the human being. Um, uh, what should I say? Uh, educating the lower parts of the human being. Civilizing and educating were words which at that time were synonymous. And, but I'm still astonished that he wasn't sort of attuned to uh, what was going on in, in, in the press. And therefore, I think there are lots of other questionable aspects about that book. Um, but I, I think it's, it would, I would, I certainly in, in my course, I address it, I highlight it, we discuss it, and we move on, as, a, as it were. Thank you for that. Magda? Uh, good afternoon. I'm saying hello from Poland and I want to say thank you because it was the most exciting and interesting lecture that I have listened so far uh, in my like in, in life experience and in online videos because it was personal and when you started that it will be personal it touched me because I knew that it was a story about um, a person who has gone a long way as a teacher and I want to ask you a couple of questions uh, which is um, probably the most useful for young teachers like me. Yes. The first is teaching is always about learning yourself and discovery. And my question would be like, do you how how did you face those facts? I was teaching something to the kids who are I don't know to use this um, term, but um, a vessel or whiteboard that I have to put the ideas, I have to put information, and I have to program them like algorithms you, you were speaking about and when did you realize that you could do it properly now and correctly because everything that you have done before seems a little bit wrong and now what 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 is your way to raise awareness about um yeah. 
these terms and this information that you just opened up in, in front of our eyes and also made questions um, inside myself as a young teacher, like how would I approach these kind of situations in the future or what was my uh, approaches before and where am I yes. now? Like how was this process for you? Thank you. I think if I gave you the answer now that you are hoping for, which is um, what do I do now that I get it right? Um, I would probably make a terrible mistake tomorrow and offend somebody without wanting to, because I would be speaking from a place of complacency. And if there's one thing that I've learned on this journey is that I can't be complacent. I can't think that I'm woke now. It's a process. Um, I'm actually very grateful for this word woke. It's being increasingly used as a, a pejorative term, as an insult in, in UK public life. Um, our home secretary referred to people like me as tofu munching, guardian reading, woke karate in parliament three weeks ago. Um, but woke comes obviously, I'm assuming it comes from waking up and waking up is a gradual thing. It's, I, I'm not sure that we can ever say that we're completely awake. But what I'm particularly grateful for in those young people that you're talking about, your pupils, is that they increasingly refuse to um, accept things that they find unacceptable. And they call me out. And every time they call me out, I have to swallow my pride for a moment and combat my tendency to become defensive and say, I hear you. Let's see if I can listen to you as well. Um, give me a bit of time to think about what you've just asked me and I'll come back to you tomorrow. So it's not what you were looking for, I think, but it's that is what Steiner calls the challenge of the consciousness soul age. We've moved a long way away from easy answers and we're beginning to realize that. Um, and we can always try. And that's what I've I'm hoping to do, but I'm sorry, I can't give you a more precise answer than this. Um, I would like to put a question and um, it's a bit questioning, um, maybe part of your, your, your talk and please take it, please don't take it personal and don't take it as a critic of what you said. It's just, I want to put it in because it's also a personal feeling of mine. Um, addressing a topic like that, as you did it in, in, a, in a very, very um, 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 good way with bringing pictures and images and really um, uh, uh, good references and everything. But nevertheless, there is an undergoing stream and it's I really, please don't take it as a critic. I just want to say it, an undergoing stream of moralism in it. And this undergoing stream of moralism that has been over, over centuries bringing into our culture by the church. You have to do it this way, you have to do it this way, you have to do it this way. And now with um, questions of diversity, questions of political correctness and so on, there's again this moralism in it. Um, and this is something I don't feel free in a, for example when you gave that example a mother loves her child and someone said to you oh no this is it's a prejudice to say it that way and if you would have said parents love their child or adults love children so we would wish every child to have a mother or a father um, um, who gives love um, to this child so it's no one has been hurt by that because you said intention um, is secondary to effect. In that moment, I think there was an assumption someone could be hurt by it. It was not the reality that you hurt someone. Mm -hmm. And this is something which happens quite often. We imagine that someone could be hurt by something we say and think, even though it hasn't been our intention. and what I say now, even though it hasn't been the real effect of it. Yes. Just the imagination, it could be. Mm -hmm. And by this, there is a moral situation around us, what we may do and not may do, because it could be that someone is hurt. 
And I think um, this gives us some kind of a, um, um, it's a strict moral way of what we may do and what, or, uh, and what we can say. Mm -hmm. It's um, even though someone can see our intention, and even though uh, could be um, able to see our intention, and even though someone can see this is a, there is someone who has no racist prejudices as a person. Maybe everyone has it. We can say, but is 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 um, trying to have awareness of it or whatever. So you see what I mean. It's yes. it's like an, an egg dance in the end. Um, if you always say what could happen, of course it's part of being a human we have flaws we do something wrong we hurt people in our surrounding and if that happens we have to react in a good way we have to establish a good connection to the people around us and we have to of course consider what could be the effect of what we say mm -hmm. um, but you see um, this kind of moralism is also something um, I don't feel very free uh, was because this this ethics of the philosophy of freedom Rudolf Steiner uh, brought and this is some kind I think often this is something that really touches me in wildlife education we don't teach morals to the children yeah, yeah I, you see in, in which I direction I want to say but uh, please mm -hmm. it's it's a question I'm not ready I, I hear it I think yeah. as you as you gave it and I would my reply would be that it becomes moralism if I step back from the consciousness soul to the mind soul and say that because this is something I've discovered, it now has validity for you as well. So if I'm systematizing a, a, a recognition that I've had, and I, and I extend its validity to everybody. And this is something that the German part in me recognizes as part of the German culture. If you have an opinion and you consider that opinion to be correct, in German you say Recht haben, to have right. In English you say, to be right. And there is a significance in which verb you use, whether to have or to be. Because if you have the right, it's harder to let go. You, you become possessive of it. And you would like to extend it to other people. And if you do that with anything, even with very good things, it becomes problematic and moralistic, as you say, quite rightly so. And I was very fortunate in that moment when I was challenged in the example that you just picked up. I was very fortunate that it was brought, I think, in a spirit of helping me to see something, not of telling me that I was wrong. Yeah, that's the difference. And I don't even know if that was Ulrika's intention, but that's how it arrived with me. So I received it as an invitation to consider something. And whether she was right or not is actually irrelevant here. The, 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 the point is that it gave me something new to think about. And that takes the moralism away from it. Where it becomes moralistic, of course, is uh, if you then enter the public domain and it becomes legislation. So for example, if you make it a law that everybody should genderize the books that are being published in Germany. Yeah, so that's, that would be a, a good example for something that could be considered problematic. But having just published a book and having made that decision myself as an editor, that's not moralistic. That's just my, my right to make a decision and to make a statement. Whether you, you then perceive it as, oh, I do that, therefore you have to do that too. That's no longer my responsibility, I think, um, unless I have power over you, which then would change the narrative again. So I would say, from the point of view of ethical individualism in the consciousness soul age, as long as we keep it personal, we should be free of moralisms here, I hope. Thank you. Last remark, because we are, time is running out. Um, it's um, one minute to nine. Uh, John Bennett, uh, you're muted, John. You have to. Yes, I, I, I strongly um, echo the um, about freedom that you, you you speak about, and it isn't specific to to Sven, who I've great admiration for, but I do think you touched on a very very important topic, which is this this question of moralism and the, the whole, um, if you like, the, the 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 whole question of wokeness and 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 the impact within our our culture. 
I, I think it's a topic that I would very strongly um, encourage people like yourself to take further as, as a theme, because I think it's a very deep element that we need to make ourselves more conscious of. So it is, uh, I'm very, very grateful for you for articulating that, because it's very easy to have a talk like this, and we all nod and say, yes, let's, let's, and we go away. And, and what you've raised is actually something to do with the the, the, the personal and the, 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 the almost imponderable um, delicacy of our own inner responses to these things. If we can raise that to consciousness in a, in a, in a, in a critical, reflective way, I think it would help us all in our work in the future. Thank you so much, especially Sven, for that really touching and wonderful and deep talk you gave to us. I think there's a lot to speak about it in future. And um, um, I would like also to add that by um, planning this whole sessions of, of this um, International Campus Waldorf, um, Sven was very much helpful and brought many ideas um, in it. So what the, the the way we do it now is really inspired by Sven. Thank you so, for, so much for that work too. And um, the suggestion for the next speaker also came by you and it's someone I don't know. It's Kate Bransby, who's going to um, be the person to talk next week on Tuesday. Um, she's from England too, as I understand. And she's uh, um, going to be speaking about schools for well-being, mental health and resilience. So I'm looking forward to that. There is one remark by Martin. Just very simply, I happen to know that Kath is very seriously ill with COVID and okay. can't, um, can't speak and okay. can't answer mails. So it might be worth um, getting a message, see if she thinks she'll be ready in a week and then finding an alternative or skipping a week. Thank you so much. We will, we will do that, Laura. You can, um... Or maybe we could have an open session. I mean, if Kath really can't, if she's too poorly, maybe we could, there are so many things that we could talk about from the last few talks. Maybe we could just have a, without a, without a talk, we could have an open space in breakout rooms or something. Thank you for that offer too. I think that could be a good, good suggestion in case Kath won't be with us and we try to reach her. Or do you have a direct um, May phone contact to her or something like that? I, I can ask her. Please I mean, do I'll, that. I can ask her. I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd rather not miss what Kath has to bring, so it might be also a possibility to see if she could swap with somebody and give her talk later. That could be. I can check that too. Okay. So we will. We um, Laura, Sven, and Martin, and we will be in contact and have a planning for the next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Goodbye. It was nice seeing you all, and have a good day. And wherever you are, see you next Thank week. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.